Other World by F. S. Flint, read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. To R. A. He is sitting beneath a cherry tree in bloom, and the thought of the ripe cherries in his mouth, and his eyes love the tall daisies in the grass, and his children playing in the meadow. The light strikes truly through the lenses of his eyes and a fair image falls upon the retina. The wind brings him many odors, earth, grasses, trees, flowers, and the oakwood burning in the fireplaces. His ears catch the rustle and song of many things, and the taste of the cherries is subtle in his mouth. He knows by their touch the things that frame his life. This is he who am I, without my cares and weaknesses. The channels of his soul are not clogged. His life flows freely. And my heart aches at the thought of the millions of miles of space, the millions of millions of miles that lie between us. He is there, I know. I am there. Since every combination exists, he must be there. I must be there. I must be happy somewhere. And yet he is so far away that I am sure no light from the star that lights and warms him can reach me, even though it travel the unimaginable number of miles a second that prove the kinship of light and electricity. So my physics master taught me. They are charlatans, these physicists. There is room in space for every combination. He is there. And he lifts his head and gazes at the cherry blossom and at the sky that must be blue for me to care for it, with a scud of white clouds over it and a warm sun shining through it. And he gazes carefree, for he knows that, just as yesterday, tomorrow there will be no call upon him no invisible gnawing bondage. He knows, I say, but I mean that I know. He knows that tomorrow will be like today and yesterday, full of work that is a pain, a pleasure, and an enlargement, with a brain and heart working together with the hands. Whatever I imagine or you imagine exist, I can see the lilac and great bushes about my house and the laburnums with their rain of gold, the chestnuts and hawthorns in bloom of red and white. These are trees and blossoms that must be there. There are other worlds, I know, where I walk, and not such pleasant places, many that are worse than this on which I write my dream, many that are hells where I suffer in greater agony of body and spirit than I have known or shall know. But there is also this one world where I am leaving the cherry tree in bloom that will bear in due season, to go back to my work after my morning meditation that is more satisfaction, a feeding of the senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing, than the probing and the solving of a problem. If the five pathways of my soul are free and clean-swept, as they are, for the swift feet of sensation. Thought is joyance, and its words are songs and images. These I carry with me to the long room that is mine, where my books are in their clean white cases, and the wide oaken table that bears my papers, a firm and solid table whose strength is a friendly pleasure, with its drawers that slide so smoothly in and out that you think always of its maker as a brother. On my walls I have placed, there, there now, pictures and drawings by my friends, which have not so much the shape of what they see about them as the form of their souls, the curves and lines, the colors, that call to mind their talk, their actions, and the intimate, wordless conversations by which you love them. I have a chair, designed and carved for me by the carpenter who lives in the house behind the ash trees, 
where the road turns at right angles to go through the village the carpenter whose garden is full of roses that clamber up and over the walls and roof of his house he comes to me sometimes of an evening and talks of the stars the constellations that light the nocturnal dreams of this faraway world and he proves to me taking them star by star and building them petal by petal that they form on the whole black dome the shape of a cluster of roses sometimes in return i read to him some of my poems and he laughs in a queer way with his hand on his chin in his beard and his eyes on the roses he has brought me that stand near the lamp on my table this is the room where i write my poems where i become conscious through them of what my wife and children and friends my orchard the meadows the trees the grasses the flowers the roads the hills and the sea mean to me and i put it into words and rhythms that explain nothing but that open the mind and the heart to a new sunshine and new perfumes i had just gone out to look at the night beyond there oh how far beyond is the star i speak of is the man i know to be myself but yet how different the pollard plane trees are wretched in the damp and darkness and mud the air bites rawly on your ribs and the sky is full of menace must i tell you of each moment of my day for you to know why i have chosen this one world of all the myriads how in the morning as the sunshine enters my bedroom dream after dream falls for me and i awake to the greater dream of this full life and my brain is rich with words and visions and my heart is eager with emotions that have grown there in the night from the seed of yesterday through the open inner door i hear in the next room the rustling and the stirring of my mate the mother of my children and she hears me too i know but we do not speak is there a need to she knows the meaning of my silence and she will not jar the full cup of my morning treasures it is all and yet how much if i see her golden head in the mirror of her room and she turns and seeing me watching smiles to the mirror for her smile seems to overarch with the blue of her eyes and to fill with tenderness the world i bear within me all that field of tall grasses that is singing with the hum of bees and the buttercups and clover and the music of the morning wind sifting its notes through the innumerable earth-held strings my children too have learned to love my strange ways i hear their voices and they hear me as i pass down to my walk in the orchard beneath the plum trees but their door does not open not till i have caught all the words and the rhythms with which my heart and brain are busy shall i see them the plum trees are in bloom and the air smells sweet with hawthorn if i stop and lean on my gate i can see a mile away the blue-brown hills beyond wide meadows flowering hedges cornland and the words come to my pencil unsought the beginning and the end perhaps with a phrase or two and full knowledge of the rest images a rhythm a complete passage the outline with some parts roughed in of my poem a song as artless as the thrushes on the plum tree tomorrow i shall wake up tired and heavy-minded with a bitter mouth and bleared eyes sluggishly reluctantly i shall pull myself from my bed i shall thrust on my shabby clothes and wash my face and hands put on a collar and tie a coat and waistcoat all in haste drink a cup of hot tea eat a few mouthfuls of bread and butter then with a hurried kiss to wife and children run down the stairs into the miserable street all i meet are shabby all go one way drawn on by the same magnet urged by the same demon we are the respectable 
and behind us, though we do not see him, driving us with his goad is hunger, the first law of our land. He enmeshes us, he regiments us, he drills us to obey his time. For him, we hurry through the dust or the mud, through the cold or heat, to the slave pens. For him, we shove at each other at the tram cars, crowd elbow to elbow in the tubes through which we are hurled, packed and swaying. For him, we sell our soul's freedom, obey men we do not respect, do trivial things that mean nothing to us, and only have meaning as part of the whole machine that we serve. Oh, irony, irony, that we should be jailer and jailed, in a prison of our own making, that we might destroy tomorrow. It is not labor that kills, but the lack of faith in the laborer. Tomorrow I shall pass the best hours of my day pent up with people who do not speak the language I seek, and who would not understand it if it were found. I shall write on papers according to rules, words that might fit my language if they were free, but they are debased and chipped and worn and crushed, and they answer words that are driven together by use and not joined by mastery, a slave language of counters. I shall come home through the darkened streets, tired and brooding over the lost hours, and loathing the weakness that led me to waste my strength in argument that started from no point of worth, and was borne on by no sustenance, a mere frittering of words and known phrases, a reaction against boredom and dullness, and the killing of life hour by hour, on a chair before a table of dusty papers and formulas invented to ensure uniformity, the wonder being that so many find themselves so well of it all, and see no wrong, and ask only for promotion. How I hate myself in these moments, tear at my weakness with the claws of my mind, and gasp out loud in the streets the thoughts that rend me. As I stalk along, overtaking all who were before me, the darkness and drabness around me suiting my mood, and crushing me further still into myself. And I become a black ferment on half-born thoughts, and still-born desires, and unborn emotions, curdled with hates and ragings, and nigh to tears. One word of love and understanding would turn my poison into wine. But do you find love and understanding in the city? Seventeen years have I passed there, and have not found them. But you are luckier, perhaps, than I, who have always been a stranger within the walls and between them, knowing the hatred of crowds, the sneers of passers, the jeers and the laughter of the clipped and maimed and castrated. Their poor, docked lives have held no beauty. Their lamps have been choked, and the guttering wick has stunk their souls out, whether they wear gold chains and good leather and cloth, or a greasy cap and torn shoddy. But on the star, the light of whose sun has not yet reached the earth and may never reach it, I come in to breakfast clean of body and rich of mind, and hungry with the morning air. My boy sits before a bowl of purple wild pansies, and my girl has a slender green jar of red poppies, whose hairy stalks spring from a blue cluster of speedwells. They have been out in the fields, barefoot in the long wet grass, the meadow foxtails brushing their legs with a silky touch, and they shook the jewels from the heart of the clover as they passed and sang with the birds. They have seen the robin still on her nest in the ivy hedge, looking at them from her ivy leaf door with the stubborn, half-frightened eyes, and they have gone on and gathered more than the poppies and pansies and speedwells, more than the primroses and violets, from the banks of the stream for their mother. They lie in a bowl before her, and she serves them bread and butter and honey. They have taken something, too, of the heart of the season, into their hearts. Its leaves and grasses will always be green there, 
its blossoms will always be bright its birds will always be singing their morning song but more than all these the intimate sense of a presence will always be with them oh my wife you sit there happy in your service giving to each as we need them fruit and milk and eggs and bread and butter and honey can i ever love you enough for your understanding and your forbearance can i ever repay you for your loving kindness o oh, my golden-hearted o oh, my young ash tree my lilac blossom my golden wheat field you have entrusted to me a treasure of many memories and i have not been careful of them i have opened the store and given them out to my friends all those who would accept them and they have grown in beauty as i touch them and the frail bloom of them that might have perished in darkness fallen to dust has become a wonderful indestructible word and you have forgiven me but when i love you and you love me they glow still fused in our love their warmth is about us and the chairs and tables the pictures and sculptures the books and bookcases all the pleasant things that furnish and comfort our lives love through us and in us oh my heart yearns to you and a great breath swells my chest see i will leave my chair and with my hand on the door latch i will turn and smile at your eyes that watch me trustfully i will go and gather a rose for you a white rose flushed with red and tinged with the gold of sunburn a rose with a firm heart and a lovely curve of petals and from the tree as i come to it a nightingale will fly away and when i return with it in my hand and offer it to you silently your eyes will thank me and you will smell it and you will gaze at the violets and primroses that children have gathered and your hand will seek mine almost timidly and caress it and now in the afternoon when the children are at their school three meadows away hidden by hedges and a row of lombardy poplars and their mother is teaching them and their playmates i sit dreaming on the veranda in the shade the warm sun falls on the crow feet and buttercups in the field before me the golden flowers nod and wave and kiss as a light warm wind passes over them the leaves are singing and faintly behind their monotone i hear the singing of children mournfully a cuckoo calls cuckoo a blackbird scuttles from a spinney and i sit in a dream and drink my coffee and smoke my cigarette but the gate of the garden in front of the house swings open and crashes back a well-known footstep comes up the path a well-known voice calls my name frankie come out you stodge is that you dicky sit down will you take a cigarette and try to live as you were meant to don't be vigorous after lunch zenade frankie fatu beau dicky c'est tout et l'on impousse que non le juin Coglion. Oh, poetio. We laugh at each other. Come down by Vale Water to the cliff walk, round to West Haven, and back by the riverside. Good. I'm with you. I'll get my stick and meet you at the gate. We swing out into the road bareheaded. Three ash trees in flower, and a laburnum raining with gold greet us. Over the hill we go and down into the valley by the side of the river that roars like the sea over its stones the silver oaks climb up the hill from the water's edge and are lost high up in a mist of gray silver of trunk and twig and bud and along the banks the primroses never leave us oh the strides and the breaths we take the jest we make and our laughter our silence is even a greater joy than these and our thoughts then wear the mask that our eyes put on them hedge of ivy and cottage garden brown roads and woods around and above it 
but our thoughts are deeper because of the mask and our silence a brook crosses the road we stride through it everywhere there are primroses along the river under the hedge in the garden up the slopes in the clearings under the first oak trees in a small meadow between the road and river where the road turns to go to the sea and our path to the cliff begins up by the pine wood our feet crunch on the gravel our breathing becomes hard and we stab at the path before us with our sticks higher and higher we climb till we reach the path round the cliff oh the golden glory of the gorse and the golden brown of last year's bracken which holds in its heart the green curl of the new and then as we round a corner the blue glory of the sea i have not the heart to go on is my friend at my side crying his joy of the seagulls descrying a cormorant do we climb down these cliffs catching at the grass for hold slipping on the granite outcrop startling a rabbit rousing the seagulls to wheel and squeal round their eyries far below are these the woods of twisted oak saplings fantastic and silvern through which the path winds is the blue that curtains the spaces between the branches the sea and more than these am i aware of the noble heart beating near me do i see the laughing generous truthful eyes do i hear the voice that sometimes mocks then jests then speaks of a poem my friend said to me as i marched by his side in the night through the mud of waterloo road this is the finest draft that has ever left england picked men all non-commissioned officers held back for months and the head of the column out of sight away in the darkness roared out a marching chorus taken up and humorously turned by the men in the rear windows opened and women's voices cheered on the soldiers who answered with jest and offered to kiss them and the kiss was taken but not in a way they knew through the mud through the mud they went and at the bends of the road the lamp of the column leader burned the blackness with red for a moment for deep they went strong young men jesting and singing and laughing with broad backs bearing their packs and broad chest breathing great breaths of the cold damp air life at its cleanest moving swiftly through the half-dead evil and the filth of the sleeping city and when they arrived at london bridge and stood in the gas-lit frowsy station the sweat was on their face and the hall was filled with the smell of healthy men what was my friend doing there the singer of beautiful things the beautiful singer what was any man of that company clerk shopkeeper laborer poet doing each with the other clothed and loaded alike and marching together with the thought of each man's heart and brain written off and their common manhood trained to move in one direction and to fit one shape what is war what are nations my friend has gone from me i could not have even him and yet in those men there was so much kindliness so much humour and so little desire to kill you may not believe in my other world but it is no dream it can be proved with compass and scales in a plus b who will integrate space and time and prove that the sum does not contain the quantity i describe or all the grades of good and evil for every man forming throughout the myriad universes a myriad perfect men and perfect minds if the scale exist can one note judge of another or say it is too remote in the instrument too vast to exist for any purpose or use or harmony what are uses and purposes can the note hear the song therefore as i sit here dreaming and writing of that other me whom i have chosen from the myriad men who bear my nature he is sitting beneath a cherry tree in bloom watching the afterglow of sunset 
and the evening stars. He is sitting in the quiet and peace of the evening and the peace of the winds. The darkness is creeping up behind him from the hills. He does not stir. The first cold shiver of evening has not come. Perhaps, in this calm, in the calm of his mind, he thinks of me. End a poem. This recording is in the public domain.